We are at the very end of the cycle. I think it's going to be more pronounced because the other thing that they've been able to, to cover up so we can't see what's really happening are those big derivative bets against all those bonds, against all the credit, with all the zombie corporations that we have out there. And, and for those that aren't familiar with the zombie corporations, those are corporations that for at least three years have not been able to pay all the interest on the debt. And the banks not wanting that to sh the, the defaults to show up on their books, they just kept l lending them money. In a recent video by financial expert Lynette Zhang, she delves into the critical state of the global financial system, emphasizing the imminent dangers associated with the ongoing dollarization. Drawing parallels between the life cycle of currencies and human beings, Zhang at the age of 69 reflects on the undeniable signs that the current monetary system is approaching its end. This expert analysis explores two key factors contributing to the crisis, the failure of central banks to control inflation through interest rates and the vanishing purchasing power of fiat currencies. Zhang begins by highlighting the reliance of central bankers on interest rates to regulate inflation, expressing concern over their repeated failures to raise rates effectively. Despite attempts to steer away from zero interest rates after 15 years, recent endeavors are proving to be a big fat fail as observed in the turmoil within the 10-year-as Treasury market. Zhang points out the lack of liquidity, hindering smooth transactions and signaling an escalating problem that traces back to 2015. Before we continue to delve into this discussion, please subscribe to our channel and activate the bell icon for timely updates. De-dollarization continues, but you know, it's really interesting because like everything, currencies have a life cycle. I'm 69, my granddaughter's eight. I guarantee you nobody's going to look at her and go, oh, she's going to be 70, or look at me and go, oh, she's going to be nine. And why would currencies be any different? So the unfortunate part is that we are at the end of this currency's life cycle. And I say that for two key reasons. Number one, because the key tool that central bankers have to control the rate and speed of inflation are interest rates. And every single time they've attempted to raise them after lowering them to zero for 15 years, it has been a big fat fail. And, and we are in the process of another fat fail right this moment. Just look at what's happening in the 10-year U.S. Treasury market, which is supposed to be the foundation of the global financial system. And the lack of liquidity in that market, which means the inability to buy and sell in a narrow price range, I mean, that's really, that started back in 2015. So it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And, you know, the normal person can't see it. But the other reason why I say that we're at the end is that there's virtually officially no purchasing power left in the currency. So it's the public confidence that's retaining any value in those fiat monies and the rapid inflation that the masses like the public has really experienced has made them start to question what's really happening because what do we hear from those in power everything's great look at the consumer strong consumer boy they've been shopping and they've been taking on a lot of debt too the amount of credit cards or new credit cards issued and all it's just like skyrocketing Right. And also, though, the banks are starting to pull back in their lending and in their issuance of credit. So they're reducing what people can access. Um, and and we're, we're starting to see them get very tight in the money front. And especially, too, with new regulations that are coming on board. There are a lot of issues that are happening. And for the Federal Reserve, we could very well see this as early as this spring kind of a repeat of what happened in 2019, the last time they attempted to raise rates, not as rapidly as they've done recently. Two and a quarter, I think, two, two and a half so, points, or 250 basis points, I think. Exactly, and the money markets, the repo markets, which is really the money markets, froze. And then they started quantitative easing, printing money, dropped the interest rates back down. And um, the repo markets, uh, which is where the, which is key for the treasury markets and the money markets that people invest in, which are mutual funds. And a lot of people say, well, isn't that safer? No, it's not safer. Um, if at the rate that they're going, 
There will be nothing left in the uh, reverse repo market by this spring, and that will force the Fed to pivot and drop rates. Whether or not that's going to happen, whether there'll be a crisis before that, my bet is that there probably be, will be something that will justify that move so that you're not really seeing what's happening. Well, the bank term funding program is expiring around that same time as well. Exactly. So there are a lot of macro factors that sort of end, or credit lines, let's call them credit lines, <laughs> yes. that sort of expire at the end of March, at the end of the Q1. Exactly. Right? So how do you see that affecting? Because I think that's $160 trillion billion market as well that needs to be refinanced. Yes, but they're also now talking about expanding that and keeping that program going because they can't really <laughs> afford to stop it, right? I mean, once you start something, starting may be easy, but stopping when people get used to it, when corporations get used to it, is very hard. And could that push us into the next crisis inside of an election year? I mean, we're, we're at a very precarious position at this moment in time, and people need to get to safety. The second compelling reason Zhang identifies for the approaching demise of the current currency system is the near depletion of purchasing power. She contends that public confidence is the only factor maintaining value in fiat currencies, emphasizing the skepticism arising among the masses due to rampant inflation. Zhang sheds light on the discrepancy between the narrative of a strong consumer and the underlying issues of increasing debt, reduced lending by banks, and tightening of credit issuance. Zhang then discusses the Federal Reserve's potential actions, foreseeing a repetition of the crisis witnessed in 2019. As the central bank attempts to raise rates, the looming expiration of the bank term funding program and credit lines could trigger a severe market downturn. Zhang speculates on the possibility of the Fed pivoting and dropping rates in response to a crisis, possibly occurring as early as the coming spring. I, in the short term, I see the yield going down, There's thus the Fed pivot because the system and the bond market is, and the banking system is imploding right now. We can't see it because they've covered it up, but that started to become obvious last March and April, right? So anybody that thinks that those issues were solved, they aren't. The banks are sitting on a tremendous amount of, of debt. You know, it's like when interest rates go up, the market value of the bonds go down, right? So if the banks are valued with the bonds being at this level when they're really at this level, just count. you've got a huge problem. So first I think we're gonna see interest rates go down, but then I think we're gonna see them spike. Do you have a target rate in mind? Like, is there a, a yield they, target? Well, know. you know, those are things that are beyond my control, but I was just gonna year, say, so. That, that was actually the number that I was okay. going to say because I can't control that, but it wouldn't surprise me to see it at 10% by the end of the year. We are at the very end of the cycle. I think it's going to be more pronounced because the other thing that they've been able to, to cover up so we can't see what's really happening are those big derivative bets against all those bonds, against all the credit with all the zombie corporations that we have out there. And, and for those that aren't familiar with the zombie corporations, those are corporations that for at least three years have not been able to pay all the interest on the debt. And the banks not wanting that to sh the, the defaults to show up on their books, they just kept l lending them money. But inside of this current market where the banks are pulling back those credit facilities, the question is, are they going to allow that to continue? Can they afford to allow that to continue? Because what happens to the market value of not just the bonds, but the mortgages, the credit loans, everything, the entire system goes completely underwater at 10% when they were put in place, or much of it was put in place at 0%. So yeah, could that create the next financial crisis that they can't cover up? Absolutely. Absolutely. The conversation shifts to the expansion of credit lines, reaching a market size of 60 trillion billion. Zhang expresses concerns about the potential refinancing issues and contemplates whether sustaining these programs could lead to an even deeper crisis within an election year. The discussion delves into the delicate position the financial system finds itself in, with Zhang urging people to seek safety in the face of impending uncertainties. Zhang anticipates a short-term decline in yields, citing a necessary Fed pivot due to the current implosion within the bond market and banking system. 
While these issues are concealed, the growing debt burden on banks remains a looming threat, with the potential for interest rates to spike. Zhang cautiously predicts a 10% interest rate by the end of the year, underscoring the fragile state of the financial system and the hidden risks posed by derivative bets against bonds and the prevalence of zombie corporations. Well, you know, I just looked, one, one of the places that I looked to, to kind of make a prediction of what the next most likely outcome is, is the monetary velocity, the number of times that money changes hands. And we've seen it peaked in 97. So that was at the point where taking on more debt actually did stimulate the economy. But since 97, that's been dropping in a very precipitous way. And one of the things that I've been paying attention to is when that turns in a precipitous way and that has already turned. So, hey, I, I could be wrong. However, I do believe that the hyperinflation that we are going to see and thus interest rates and that inflation moving up a lot more rapidly, I believe that's already started. And that's witnessed by that shift in a very pervasive way in the, in the monetary velocity chart, because that, that is completely trend shift. And that's the other thing, right? What, what I'm talking about are repeatable patterns that you see every time you reach the end stage of a currency's life cycle, just like the age, et cetera, of a human being, right? You can see these patterns and they just repeat over and over and over again. And you don't even need to necessarily understand them at a deep level. But if what you do understand is that whenever there is a pattern shift, it means something, right? Then you can see that we are at the end. And, and, the, and the movement upward in the monetary velocity, where's inflation going? They haven't conquered inflation. That's garbage. That is absolute garbage. I'll go on level. I'll put my technical neck on the line for that. So yes, I, sticky, yes, very, <laughs> very sticky. sticky. And the difference between inflation and hyperinflation is simply the speed at which it happens. Mm -hmm.